in previous videos we've talked about the SN2 and SN1 mechanisms and so this video uh, we're going to discuss the two elimination mechanisms uh, E1 and E2. So what are we going to learn from this video? Uh, number one we're going to learn about what elimination is, uh, how to tell when elimination occurs, uh, which is more like a review. Um, we're going to talk about both the E1 and the E2 mechanisms, the reaction conditions for those mechanisms, as well as the geometric constraints that are uh, necessary for the E2 mechanism. Um, how to tell the difference between a strong base and a nucleophile, and also one very important rule for um, learning elimination, which is learning about what Zaitsev's rule is. And we're going to, at the very end, we'll have a comparison of the E1, E2, SN1, and SN2 uh, mechanisms. What's an elimination? So if you remember from uh, Organic 1, uh, we talked about four different types of reactions. We talked about substitution, uh, addition, rearrangement, and then elimination. So elimination happens between two adjacent carbons, and it happens when on one of those carbons you remove a proton, and on the carbon adjacent to it, you lose a leaving group. Um, and and that when that happens, um, a pi bond is the result. So let's look at a quick example. So here is, and I'll, in this case, let's just say the leaving group is a halogen. So here's an alkyl halide. Let's look at the arrows. So the base attacks here, and you have proton transfer. So the base deprotonates. Uh, the electrons and the carbon hydrogen bond come here to make a double bond and then the uh, carbon leaving group electrons leave with the leaving group notice the two carbons are adjacent to one another and so the flow of electrons again is from base to the proton from the CH bond here these bond these electrons these electrons go to make the carbon carbon pi bond and then in doing that, you also kick out the leaving group heterolytically, uh, taking a pair of electrons with it, right? And then the resulting product, you have again here an alkene or a multiple bond, not always an alkene. You can also do eliminations to get uh, alkynes or triple bonds, right? You have the conjugate acid of the base and then the leaving group, right? So here... And, and elimination, this is what we're concerned with. We, we look at these two adjacent carbons, and on this carbon, this is what we call the alpha proton. All right, that's the proton that's adjacent to the carbon containing the leaving group. And then in the product, once the alpha proton is removed and those electrons uh, are up here to make this new pi bond in the product, we also lose the leaving group. So elimination always results in the formation of a pi bond. All right, so let's talk about two elimination pathways. Um, this is definitely not exhaustive, uh, but for the scope of the class, we're only going to focus on E2 and E1. Here at the top, you see an alkyl halide. I uh, have a potassium terbutoxide, which is a strong base, and the resultant alkene is here with um, terbutanol and potassium bromide as side products. And then on the bottom, you see I have an alcohol that I'm treating with sulfuric acid and again in the product we have a resultant um, alkene and then sulfuric acid gets reformed plus water. The top reaction is an example of a reaction that goes through an E2 mechanism. The bottom reaction is an example of uh, a reaction that goes through an E1 mechanism. So let's talk about the E2 elimination. So I here I have an alkyl halide. Notice again alpha proton and then my leaving group. Okay, so on this carbon, I have a hydrogen. This carbon, I have my leaving group. And then I treat this with a strong base, in this case, potassium terbutoxide. Here you can see this is the mechanism where the base comes in, deprotonates here. The, this pair of electrons comes here to make the pi bond. And then this pair of electrons leaves with bromine. And so what I want to point out here is that the alpha hydrogen, which is this hydrogen here, and the leaving group, which is bromine, are in, in an orientation that we call anti-periplanar. That means they're on uh, in the same plane, but they're on different 
faces of the plane so that you can see the hydrogen is on the top side of the plane and then the leaving group is on the bottom side of the plane. Notice the orientation where hydrogen is here and then the leaving group is here. That's called anti-periplanar. In order for E2 elimination to occur, the, the alpha hydrogen and the leaving group be anti-periplanar. If we think about this in terms of a Newman projection, notice the bromine is here and it's anti to the hydrogen, meaning they're on opposite sides of one another. So here's the transition state where the base is coming in here. You have a partially formed bond between uh, oxygen and hydrogen. You have a partially broken carbon-hydrogen bond, a partially formed carbon-carbon pi bond, and then a partially broken carbon-bromine bond. All right? The E2 is similar to the SN2 in that it's also concerted. Right, all of these, all of this is happening at the same time, and again, you can see that the alpha hydrogen and the bromine are what we call anti-periplanar. They are on the opposite sides of the same plane, and this is all concerted. So when we look at the energy diagram, we can see that we start here with the reactants, and we end up here at the products, but it's all happening in one step, and the transition state here is what we have depicted over here for the E2 elimination is similar to the SN2 and that the reaction is concerted however it's not a substitution but it's an elimination and so let's look at the product so here I have an alkene as a product I have uh, terbutanol which is formed when the uh, terbutoxide anion deprotonates here and then I have KBr which is formed when the counter ion from here and bromine form an ionic bond. Um, the E2 mechanism requires a, a good strong base in order to do that uh, proton transfer or that deprotonation. And so what I have here is a list of some really good bases. What I want to point out from this list is this. Um, you know, I think part of the main issue with E2, E1, SN2, and SN1 is distinguishing between what's a base, what's a nuclear file, and so on and so forth. And so if you look at this list, these are some really common bases that are used to do uh, the E2 elimination, right? You have DBN, which has this structure here. The lone pair on nitrogen is basic. Um, you, you see potassium terbutoxide. Uh, here's the terbutoxide anion, and then potassium is just a counter ion. Uh, here you have potassium hexamethyl disalazide, which has this structure where you have potassium as a counter ion and a negatively charged uh, nitrogen here and then LDA lithium diisopropyl amide which is another really really strong base uh, another amine base and, and a lot of times your amines are going to act as bases and then you have butyl lithium which is shown here where you have a covalent bond between carbon and lithium and that carbon is partially negative and is really highly basic and if you look at the trend right base strength increases as the pKa of the conjugate acid of these bases increases okay so in general bulky alkoxides and bulky amines are very basic and they favor E2 elimination so if you see any of these uh, bases on an exam on a standardized, standardized test you'll know immediately that those bases are used for E2 elimination alright so how do we tell the difference in a nucleophile and a base I'll be the first one to say that this is not a very straightforward argument. Um, I've, I've, I've looked at this in several different places, and the argument is just not straightforward. In, in, in reality, nucleophilicity and basicity kind of parallel one another. And so it's really condition dependent. It's dependent on what the substrate is. It's dependent on what the solvent is, whether it's a hard or a soft acid or a base. And so here's a, here's a kind of a way that we can remember this is if the pKa of the base is conjugate acid meaning the base that you want to use if you add a hydrogen to it and look the pKa up of what that conjugate acid is if it's higher than the pKa of water then that base will more than likely do elimination if it's lower than the pKa of water then that base will more than likely do substitution uh, I talked about this before in class about the hydroxide anion and the thing about hydroxide is this, it can be a base or it can be a nucleophile, it just depends on the conditions. So let's summarize the E2 
uh, mechanism. We know it's concerted. We know that it's bimolecular. That's what the two stands for. Uh, we know that the rate is a two-term uh, rate law with where uh, it's, it's K times the concentration of the substrate times the concentration of the base. We know that um, the E2 mechanism requires a strong base. Uh, it works better in polar aprotic solvents, meaning solvents that don't give up H+. Plus, and that's just logical uh, when you think about if you add a base to a protic solvent, all that base is going to do is get protonated. It won't, it won't do what you intend for it to do. All right, so we know the leaving group and the alpha hydrogen have to be anti-periplanar. And we also know uh, that this, the E2 mechanism actually occurs more readily on tertiary substrates. And the reason is because from a tertiary substrate, you can get a more substituted uh, alkene in the product. And we'll talk more about that later on in the video.